introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Julie Hart from the Duchess Land Agency, or DLC. And she uh, joined the DLC staff in 2007. And previous to that, she had worked for the Cary Institute as a research specialist studying nutrient cycling in upland forests and the impacts of invasive species and pathogens um, on forest health. So that gives you a, a little grip on the detail that she understands these systems at. Um, um, so right now, she serves as the DLC's resident expert in ecology and biodiversity. Um, as her present position, her new present position, is Director of Education. Uh, she's responsible for overseeing the DLC's diverse public education programs as they work with local organizations and schools and farms and historical societies, <laughs> um, connecting people to the land. That's what's important to us. Um, it, and I, I can say this from experience, from having worked with her at the community level and also in my own backyard, um, that she embraces her role enthusiastically. And so it's a pleasure for me to do this with you. Thank you, Allison, and thank you all for coming out tonight. It's great to see you all and some nice familiar faces in the crowd. Um, so yeah, I've been Millbrook-centric for quite a long time, working at the Cary Institute and then at the Dutchess Land Conservancy. Um, so it's great to, to come out and, and be part of your community. So I also want to acknowledge a couple of my coworkers who are here tonight. We've got Doug Olin in the back, who's our communications director, and Carolyn over here, who is uh, doing a fellowship at the DLC this year. So I'm very glad to have them here as well. So tonight we're going to cover 15,000 years of history. <laughs> how, how much time do I have again? <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get through it all. So I want to talk about land conservation in Dutchess County, but kind of at a very large scale and a very long-term scale. So we're going to talk about the local landscape and how it's changed over time, and then we'll talk about the Duchess Land Conservancy and what we do. So thinking about how the land got the way it is now, and how the Duchess Land Conservancy and other conservation organizations are working to protect the land so that in the future we can still have a working, functional landscape. So the land as it is right now looks like this. We're so used to looking at maps that have lines drawn on them, you know, roads and tax parcels and wetland boundaries and all of those lines that we draw on maps. Um, but I like to just look at a map without human lines on it sometimes. So this is from Google Earth. This is what you get when you shut off all of those lines and you just look at the land. And you can see some patterns here. This is kind of our area of the Hudson Valley. This is what just found right here. That little oogie at the southwest corner where Beacon is. Um, and you can see the darker green that's the forests, lighter green that is the farmlands, and the very light colors are usually urban areas. And so, what I've found over the years is that when you look at a lot of maps, which we do at the DLC, I always say our tagline should be there's no such thing as too many maps. Um, so, we bring maps everywhere. Uh, but when you look at maps a lot, when you look at the land a lot, you realize that the land is alive and it tells a story. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight, is the story that our landscape tells us. So rolling back the clock to about 15,000 years ago. So the most recent ice age is kind of winding down. Glaciers are starting to melt and recede to the north. And at that time, our area is completely covered in ice. Um, everything around us was under about a half mile thick sheet of ice. And as you probably know, this ice was part of an enormous glacier, the Laurentide Ice Sheet, that was pushing down from Canada. It got as far south as Long Island, and it didn't stop because it hit Long Island. It stopped and then made Long Island. So Long Island, as many of you probably know, is what's called a terminal moraine. So all of the rocks and gravel that the glacier had pushed in front of it ended up there. And that big pile that's Long Island and Martha's Vineyard and Cape Cod, that's all part of the end of the glacier. 
the big pile of stuff that was pushed in front of it. So that's how far south the glacier got. And I want to take you on a long timeline here. So we'll examine the last 12,000 years of history. So buckle up, a lot happened, <laughs> starting with the glacier retreating. So about 12,000 years ago, the Ice Age is really, really coming to an end. Temperatures are warming, the glacier is melting and retreating. And when we say retreating, glaciers don't actually ever go backwards. They only go forwards. But they retreat by melting faster than they're freezing and pushing. So 12,000 years ago, the glacier is retreating from our area. It's gradually melting. And over time, soil begins to form. Because remember, when the glacier moved over the land, everything was plowed in front of it. And so there was no soil there when the glacier melted. It was piles of rocks as far as the eye could see. And some pioneering organisms like lichens and mosses would have been the first ones to come in. You know, you see lichens on rocks. And one of the things that they can do is actually break rocks down over long periods of time through chemical weathering. And so soil formation begins, and gradually over time you start to see plants coming in. So grasses would have been early pioneers, other green plants would come in. As the soil is forming and becoming deeper and deeper, the soil is, is kind of a particular favorite topic of mine. I'm not going to let you out of here without me telling you a little bit about soil. Um, the way I think of it is the soil is a transition layer between rock and sky. And so soil is made up of mineral components, which is weathered rock. It's basically bits of rock that has weathered down small enough to become part of the soil. And it's made up of organic components that are, it start out as rotting vegetation, basically. So the leaves that come down in the fall, when a dead tree falls down, that wood is all going to be broken down. And the soil is made up of the mineral components from the weathered rocks below and the decaying vegetation and organic matter from above. So soil is this amazing transitional layer between rock and sky. It takes a long time to form. But over time, it's growing deeper and deeper, and grasses are taking over. And eventually, trees come into the landscape and would have come up from the south, where it was not glaciated. And the seeds would gradually come into the landscape and continue to spread over this new landscape. And so this took thousands of years. Nobody really knows how long it took to go through this progression of bare rock to a little bit of soil to grasses to trees. But it took quite a long time. And then at some point, nobody really knows when, but at some point, humans arrived in the area. And so the indigenous tribes were coming in from the west and the south for the most part, and gradually moving into this area. And so where we are right now, um, at the time of European contact, this was the territories of the, the Manse Lenapes to the south. So the Manse Lenape territory came up into our area. And we're also at the southern edge of the Mohicans. So the Mohicans tended to be north and east of us. Monse Lenape was south. And the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois Confederacy as they're better known, was to the north and the west of us. And so what existed was a civilization. Millions of people lived here in all these different tribes. Um, around the northeast, all down the eastern seaboard, across the plains to the west coast and into Central and South America, and into the Arctic as well. So the land was covered with people and they managed it in ways we don't entirely know everything about. Ar archaeological evidence has shown that, you know, these were farmers, that they would um, grow crops, um, hunter-gatherers that would go into the woods and, you know, hunt game, but also a, a large farming component of these civilizations. And so for a long time, the indigenous peoples were the stewards of our land here in, in the Hudson Valley. And so things started to change pretty rapidly. And the reason I'm showing you such a long time scale is just because, you know, humans have such narrow lifespans compared to the land itself. The land can remember a lot more than we can. So the age of 
exploration is moving on. Columbus is reaching the Caribbean in 1492, and the Half Moon with Henry Hudson sails up the Hudson River in 1608 or 09? One or the other. Does anybody remember? 09? That sounds right. Okay. Um, so Henry Hudson sails up through Hudson, what we now call the Hudson River, in 1609. Um, the indigenous tribes called that body of water the Mohicanito, which means the river that flows both ways, or the big water that never stops moving. The translation is a little difficult. Um, but that was obviously like a highway. That was a focal feature of life at the time. It was a lot easier to get around on the water than it was to get through the hills and the, the rocks and the forests. So the river was the major artery. So the Half Moon is sailing up the river in 1608. There's not a lot of colonization at the time. That was really one of the first instances of contact between the, the Europeans and the indigenous peoples. And so the landscape at the time was relatively forested. There were openings as well. Another component of the landscape, which doesn't get nearly enough attention as far as my eco ecological soul is concerned, was the beavers. Um, Beavers had a huge impact on the landscape. I don't have time to tell you all about beavers tonight, but believe me, I could tell you a lot. Um, and so the beavers were creating a lot of wetlands. When their dams broke, what was left was a, a meadow, and the indigenous peoples would use that as a garden. That was a good place for agriculture. And so the landscape that existed at the time was, was heavily managed by the indigenous peoples but in ways that the Europeans didn't recognize as being management. A very, very strong culture clash going on. And so these photos that I'm showing you are from the Harvard Forest, where they've done a lot of wonderful research on the history of the land and the forests in the New England area. So this is their um, approximation of what the land would have looked like in 1700. Lots of forests, really big trees. Moving forward, remember in so 1700, that's almost 100 years after Henry Hudson went up the river, but there's still not a lot of colonization happening yet. There's certainly contact, there are people living here, but it's a very, very gradual process. So if you'll remember the date of the Great Nine Partners patent, 1696, Seven. is that right? Seven. Again, I wish Seven. that people would probably know more about this than I do. 1697? Okay, so late 1600s, early 1700s, Dutchess County is being split up into patents that are granted by the Crown. And that, as I recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, in the, the, um, the reason that was being done was to um, improve the landscape, to settle it, to get settlers onto the land where they had previously not really gone. And so this was all happening right around 1700. And as the colonists arrived, they began to clear the trees for farming. So a lot of tree clearing at the time, um, axes, saws, everything you can imagine, forests being cut down pretty extensively to allow space for farming to take place. And so by the middle of the 1700s, the landscape is still pretty forested, but you've got a lot of clearings now. You've got a lot of these hard scrabble farmsteads that are being carved out of the landscape. Um, mostly pretty small farms, subsistence level farming. And this is continuing through the rest of the 1700s. And this is a time period that I find pretty fascinating because, again, you know, the land is telling you a story, but a lot of that story is written in our roadmaps and our place names. So if you think about what was happening during the late 1700s and early 1800s, this is where we got things like Lime Kiln Road and Grist Mill Lane and Creamery Lane. These were the farms and the industries that were springing up around here. And those names remain on the landscapes. The lime kilns are long gone. The creamery is gone. All of those places have changed significantly. But the names are still on our maps. So there's a lot of stories in our road maps as well as our you know, aerial photos and the other maps that we and so as time is going by, we're getting into the 1800s now. And at this point, to the early 1800s, most of the land has been cleared for farming. And so in some areas of New England, we're looking at a decrease of almost 
um, almost completely forested landscape to having only about a quarter to a third of the landscape still forested. Lots and lots of clearing. So you can see this is the same place we were looking at before in the other photos, but now all the forests are cleared. It's all farm fields and lots of stone walls are being built. The mid-1800s is a period of really intense stone wall building. And I think a lot of, a lot of times we think those stone walls are older than they really are. We tend to sometimes think of them as like pre-revolutionary war artifacts. And certainly some of them are that old. Um, but the period of greatest stone wall building was in this kind of early 1800s, early to mid 1800s period. And the reasons are really, really interesting. So for one thing, let me ask you this. If you had to build a fence, would you rather build it out of wooden posts or rocks? How many people say wooden posts? Post. Yes, exactly. Anybody want to build it out of rocks? Okay, you're, you're a sensible group. That's good. So yeah, of course, if you have to build a fence, you'd so much rather build it out of wooden posts. It's a lot easier. But you have to remember, they're kind of running out of trees at this point. The landscape was really bare of trees. And so it was getting to be of a concern um, that you know people needed wood to build. They needed wood to heat their homes. We didn't have oil furnaces in the 1800s. And so the loss of trees was starting to have a really significant impact on people's lives. And it was becoming a very big inconvenience to not have those trees readily available. And so there's a lot of stone walls for two reasons. One is that they had kind of run out of trees, and so rocks were a good alternative. And also, there's a lot of rocks here. You might have noticed that. Are, are you gardeners <laughs> over here? here? <laughs> yes, exactly. So you might have noticed there's some rocks in the ground here. And because the forests had been cleared, Remember, the tree roots were stabilizing the soils. And so once the trees were cleared, frost was able to penetrate much deeper into the soil in the winter time. And that allowed those frost heaves to start kicking more rocks up to the surface. So you know about the spring planting, but there was also the spring rock harvest, which was before you could plant, you had to go and haul the rocks out of the field. And that's where we got a lot of these walls from. Linear landfills is one term that I've used, I've heard to refer to them. And so, you know, this is a time of great movement in rocks. And the amount of stone walls, a lot of different estimates, um, um, but sources that I've read say that there were about 250,000 miles of stone walls throughout all of New England and eastern New York. Just for perspective, that's how far it is to the moon. <laughs> that's a lot of stone walls. I think the estimates are that the amount of rock moved to make the stone walls of New England and New York is equivalent to, I believe it's the Egyptian pyramids times 100. It's a lot of rock. So, other things are happening now, though. Things are starting, the pace of life is starting to pick up. And things are changing in a really drastic way that has a huge impact on the landscape. So in the late 17 and early 1800s, the Industrial Revolution is really kicking into gear. And remember, these are very hard scrabble farms that are increasingly rocky. It's very, very difficult to make a living and support a family on these farmsteads. And so people start abandoning their farms and moving to the city where they can get a job in a factory. So there's a general migration of farm folk to cities to get jobs in factories. And also remember in the early 1800s, 1803, the Louisiana Purchase opens up the Midwest. And so as people began to explore the Midwest, they came back with tales of a place where you can stick a shovel in the ground and not hit a rock. And people said, that sounds great, I'm going there. And so again, <laughs> These farms were being abandoned in droves and people were moving out to the Midwest. And also the Erie Canal, which was completed in 1825, also opening up a pathway to the west, western New York, and to the Great Lakes and the Midwest. So all of the, these things are happening in that early 1800s time period. And life is really, really changing. People are starting to not want to have to scrape a living off of this rocky landscape. They're either moving west or into the cities. 
And so this is a period of abandonment of farms. And so the late 1800s, you start to see a landscape that's in large part no longer actively farmed. And what happens when you no longer farm a field? It starts to turn back into forest. And it takes a while. The process of succession, as we call it in ecological circles, takes some time. You know, first you have your farm grasses that probably keep coming back, and then you'll get some tree seedlings and shrubs, and it'll gradually, over 100 years or so, transition from a field to a forest. And so this process is starting in the late 1800s. By the early 1900s, you've got a lot of shrub lands, and as you get into the 1930s, forests are starting to grow back. And so if you actually went out and dated the forests of Dutchess County, most of them are about this old, less than 100 years. We certainly have trees that are older than that, individual trees that were left because they are in you know, an inaccessible place or marking a property corner or planted near a house or something. So there are definitely trees much older than that. But our forests in this area in general are just about 100 years old or thereabouts. And so thinking about this is really you know, it's a lot to wrap your head around. There's a lot of history here. Uh, but thinking about it from the perspective of the land. So, you know, this is a landscape that's undergone a lot of changes. And remember that time is kind of perceived differently based on your own perspective. So the average human lifespan might be, you know, 70, 80 years old. Um, an oak tree can live for hundreds of years. Some trees can live for thousands of years. Your average dragonfly lives for two weeks before it dies when it's in its adult stage. So different forms of life are going through their life cycles you know, at different paces. And when you think about the land, all of these changes that it's been through, it took thousands and thousands of years for those forests to grow, and then they were stewarded by the indigenous peoples. And that was thousands and thousands of years of history. And then starting around 1700, just the last four, three or 400 years, all of these huge changes have taken place on the landscape. So from our perspective, it seems, you know, 400 years seems like a long time to us. But from the land's perspective, it must seem like it's just, you know, in a boxing ring getting clobbered. It's just like bam, 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 one thing after another. And so from the land's perspective, things changed really, really fast here, several times. So, so kind of keep that in mind as we're going forward. So this is some data from Harvard Forest showing um, forest cover in the New England states. They don't count New York as part of New England, I'm sorry to say. Um, but you can see each line is a state. The left side of the graph is the year 1600, and this side is the year 2000. So we're looking at 400 years of history here. And so you can see that you know, from 1600 until the middle of the 1800s, a very steep decline in forest cover. When those farms are abandoned, the forests start to grow back quite quickly, as a matter of fact. So they don't quite bounce back to their pre-colonial levels, but a lot more forest than there had been just 50 years before. But the difference is that you see another decline starting or in the middle of the 1900s. And so historically, you know, you look at a graph and you say, oh, well, it goes up and it goes down. But you think about the reasons for these changes. So the initial phase of tree clearing from 1600 to the middle of the 1800s, that was forest being cleared for farming. And so when those farms were abandoned, the trees were, were able to grow back because they were just farm fields, perfectly nice places for trees to grow. But this more recent period of tree clearing is clearing for development. It's putting in new roads, it's building malls and parking lots and houses. And so that's the kind of clearing that it's more difficult for the land to recover from. A tree can't just go colonize a parking lot if you happen to abandon it. It eventually will, but it takes a lot longer. It's much more difficult for the land to, to reclaim those areas that have been cleared for development. So another way to think about that is, what do all of these things have in common? 
Anybody? They're all human, touched by humans. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you notice about their structures? They all have layers. They're round. They all have layers. For anyone confused by the chicken, chickens are layers. <laughs> Then you've got layers of soil, then the plant community, then the animals, and all of these things occur in patterns that we often think are random but aren't. So, you know, we look at the land and, oh, there's a bunch of trees and those trees are different and these are all, you know, how, how do you tell what's what? Um, but biology is predictable in some ways. There's definitely random elements, but, you know, for any given soil type, you will have a sense of what kind of plants will be able to grow there based on the characteristics of that soil. So a heavy wet soil, you know, a red maple tree will probably be able to grow there just fine, but a red oak won't. A red oak wants to be on a better drained upland. And so different plants have different tolerances for where they can grow. As gardeners, I'm sure you know this. Some plants will grow in shade and some really want sun. And so there are these predictable patterns in the landscape, and it's all connected. It is, as Tennyson put in his poem Ulysses, life piled on life. Now, Tennyson wasn't writing about this at all. He was writing about something completely different. But that phrase just really popped out at me as a good way to describe the land itself. It's life piled on life. And another quote, um, if you ever seen me talk before, you'll know that you cannot get through a Julie Hart presentation without a good quote from Alda Leopold. Um, has everybody read the Sand County Almanac? One of the founding books of the conservation era, basically. Um, so Alda Leopold was writing this book in the early 1900s, and it's remarkably timely for today. It's amazing how prescient he was. And, and so this is his way of looking at the land. It's not merely soil, it's a fountain of energy flowing through a circuit of soils, plants, and animals. And so that's how I think of it when I'm looking at a landscape. I don't just see individual objects or species, I see it as a whole functioning thing. And that interconnectedness of the landscape and thinking about how it got the way it is today and also considering what we want it to look like in the future is how we segue into our conversation about the Duchess Land Conservancy. So I give you all of that 15,000 years of history to show how the land got the way it is right now. And now I want to shift into talking about the DLC and other conservation organizations and how we're working to maintain the landscape, not in perfectly intact. You can't keep everything the way it is forever. Change happens, and it's perfectly natural that it happens. But thinking about maintaining the functionality of the landscape is a really, really key component of conservation. And so maintaining the interconnectedness of the forests with the wetlands and the streams allows the species that use those areas to continue to thrive and survive. So what is a land trust? We'll just go over this pretty quickly. It's very basic information. So a land trust is a nonprofit organization that works to conserve the land. That's basically in everyone's mission statement. And they do this either through acquiring land or protecting it with conservation easements and through the stewardship of the land. And so land trusts are highly variable. There's some probably some familiar names here. In Dutchess County, we have um, Dutchess Land Conservancy, Scenic Hudson, Oblong Land Conservancy, which works more in the Dover Pauling area, and Winnicky, which is up in Rhinebeck and focuses on the northwest corner of Dutchess. So we're all local land trusts. Scenic Hudson's more like a regional land trust. They cover nine counties. And then you get into the nationwide organizations, the Trust for Public Land, the Nature Conservancy, the American Farmland Trust. So a lot of different types of conservation going on at a lot of different levels. There's a lot of different 
scales of conservation going on. So at this point, there are over 1,400 land trusts in the United States, um, and 442 of those, so I'm not sure what percentage that is, um, are accredited. And that means we've gone through a lengthy process of certification, basically. So there's an accreditation commission that asks you to submit a lot of documentation to show that you're doing things in the way that they're supposed to be done. And making sure all of your standards and practices are being followed and that all of the correct steps are being taken in the process of land conservation. Making sure that it's being done right. So, um, throughout the nation, land trusts have protected over 56 million acres of land, which is the size of Pennsylvania and New York combined. So that's the area of protected land, protected by land trusts. And in New York, we protected over 2.7 million acres, so about 10% of the state. So let's talk a little bit about the founding of the Dutchess Land Conservancy. There might be some, some names here that you know. Um, so in the 1950s, Kent Levitt, who was the owner of Fraley Hill Farm, up on Fraley Hill Road, formed what was called the Northeast Dutchess Open Space Committee. And they were promoting open space preservation and education. And when he died in 1973, that committee just kind of stopped operating. He was really the driving force behind it. But in 1983, Owen Boyd, who was the uh, manager of the Wethersfield estate, and, uh, which, as you probably know, is Chauncey Stillman's estate um, up on Pugsley Hill Road, found out that there was still some money left in the account for that open space committee. And so they were kind of reinvigorated at that time. And also right around this time, there's starting to, we're starting to see a lot more development pressure here in this part of Dutchess County. And so there was an article in the New York Times about some farms that were being eyeballed by a developer to be turned into developments with a lot of houses on them. And these were all on Bangalamenia Road. So the Cagney Farm, that's Jimmy Cagney's place. A lot of you are probably familiar with that. Um, and then Ben Shelton Farm, just down the road from there, and the Sheldon Farm, which ultimately became part of Wethersfield. And so this was in the mid-1980s. And the neighborhood around Bangalamania Road and Fraley Hill Farm um, kind of came together and said, we got to do something about this. They were picturing Bangalamania Road covered with subdivisions. And if you've driven on Bangalamania Road lately, you know there's no subdivisions there. And these people are why because they came together and decided, we need to do something. We have to protect this landscape. There's so many farms here. We have to keep these farms active. And so they formed what ultimately became the Dutchess Land Conservancy in 1985. So they consulted with the Brandywine Land Conservancy, which is down in Pennsylvania, which was well established and could give them advice on how to be up and running as a land trust. And so these three farms were all purchased and protected. And so the Sheldon Farm became part of Weathersfield. It was purchased by Chauncey Stillman. And the other two were purchased and protected by North Dutchess Properties. And so over this time period, there was a pretty intense amount of activity focusing on protecting this really, really special area of the county. And so that's where we come in. So the Dutchess Land Conservancy has been around since 1985. Um, dedicated to preserving the scenic, agricultural, and environmental resources of Dutchess County and surrounding areas. And we do this through protecting the land through conservation easements, which are um, a document wherein a landowner is voluntarily giving up some of their development rights in order to protect the natural resources. And so, for example, if you had a 100-acre farm and you lived in an area of 10-acre zoning, Technically, you could split that up into 10 parcels and probably sell them off for a lot of money. But a farmer who owns 100 acres doesn't want 10 houses. They want to keep that land open for farming. They want maybe one or two houses. So what they're able to do is donate those development rights in the form of this conservation easement. So they're basically saying, I'm giving up the right to build those additional houses. I'm giving up the right to completely subdivide this property. And in the interest of protecting the natural resources that are there, whether it's the, the farmland soils, the steep slopes, the wetlands, the rivers and streams that we have. 
So protecting land is a really, really key component of what we do. Also stewarding the land, so working with those conservation landowners who have protected their lands with easements and you know, making sure that they have the resources they need to steward the land in a careful and considerate manner. And also through education. That's part of what I do, coming out and doing public programs, working with the public, as many you know, local community groups as we can find to help people understand the importance of conservation. So, screenshot from our new website. Um, it adds up to more than the total. <laughs> So we've got over 20,000 acres of farmland protected, over 20,000 acres of forests, almost 5,000 acres of water, meaning streams and wetlands and connected systems. The total protected acreage, I forget the exact number right at this moment, but it's over 45,000 acres. And those numbers add up to more than that because, of course, there's some overlap. Some wetlands are also forested, so, so there's definitely some overlap in those acreages. But that's where we are right now. So here's our map of protected lands. All of the bright green areas are lands protected by easements that are held by the Duchess Land Conservancy. Then there are other protected areas that are owned by state, local, and federal governments. Like this is the Appalachian Trail down here, um, Tivoli Bays, the states along the Hudson that are owned by the National Park Service. There's actually quite a lot of protected land in Duchess County. So at this point, we've protected over 45,000 acres, just the DLC. We've been accredited since 2009 and go through a periodic re-accreditation process um, to make sure we're doing everything right. We've adopted all of the newest policies and procedures that are necessary. Our staff is now 14 people. To put that in perspective, when I started at the DLC in 2007, there were seven of us. <laughs> so it's a growing organization, which is great. It allows us to do a lot more of the work that we do. 28 members of our board of directors. And we're in the top 3% nationwide in terms of acres protected by conservation easements. So for a small local land trust, we, we pack a real punch in terms of our overall easement holdings. Um, top 1% nationally in terms of the number of easements held. We hold, at this point, 425, give or take, conservation easements. 425! <laughs> that have, you know, everyone's owned by, it. every easement is different, they're owned by different people. We work with almost 500 different landowners in total. So it's an enormous amount of work. And what we see though is uh, people who are so excited to protect their land, they're so excited to know that they're being, that they're part of something bigger, that they're helping to protect the landscape. Because, you know, our 425 easements, we don't have the individual lines on here, but you know, this is an area, this is Weathersfield in that whole Bengal Amenia Road area, and it's several thousand acres of protected land that's a couple dozen different easements owned by a few dozen different people. So it's a very collaborative kind of work to do, and it's nice to see so many people interested in protecting their land for the future. So, another thing I want to mention is um, a new initiative that we have, which is our volunteer and community science program. And this is something we've just kicked off this year. We have a new um, outreach and engagement manager. So, we're looking for volunteers. We're doing some trail development and maintenance, and also looking for people who are experts in your field and might be willing to lead you know, a, a nature walk or a history walk that, some, that we could you know, open to the public. Um, looking for all different kinds of volunteers and hoping to use that as a way to connect even more with other communities that we haven't been able to be in touch with before. So to really, really broaden out the scope of what we do. Now this doesn't all happen in a vacuum. Um, I have a couple of graphs here. The one on the left is funding sources. So this is specific to farmland protection. And so these are places where we're actually able to purchase the development rights from the farmer. And so they are able to take the money and use it to support their farming operations. Some farmers have purchased additional acreage to add to their farming operation, or they have enhanced their farming operation in some ways. One of them built a new farm store where they're able to interact with the public a lot more and have um, products from neighboring farms as well. 
So the State Department of Agriculture and Markets has had a wonderful program that allows us to work with them to protect farmland. And Dutchess County's Partnership for Manageable Growth also has been a huge, huge impact on our ability to protect farmlands. So between the state and the county and towns that have funding for open space preservation, you know, we've been able to leverage that money to protect, um, I wish I had the exact number off the top of my head, but I don't, but it's over 40 individual farms. And these are farms that you know, in some cases, these farms have been in the family for generations. I've worked with a couple different families in the last two years that um, they were seventh generation, seventh generation on those farms. One of them had been there since before the Revolutionary War. And so to work with people who have such an incredible bond with the land and to help them stay on that farm, keep that farm viable, and allow them to continue their farming legacy is, is really, really special. I think it's something that we all enjoy working with those farmers. And the graph on the right, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but I kind of am. Um, this is the total area protected in Dutchess County. And this big green section is the DLC. So this is area in acres. Um, so this is the Cary Institute's acreage, this is the county-owned parcels, this is everything that the DLC is protected. Then we have federal government, Audubon, which is Buttercup Preserve in Stanford, the Nature Conservancy's lands, which are Thompson Pond and Pine Plains and a couple other places, um, the state lands, which include Tivoli Bays, the federal lands, which is, is um, primarily the Hudson River Estates and the Appalachian Trail. And other land trusts, scenic Hudson and Winnicky. So, <coughs> I was pretty amazed when I put this graph together. I did not know it was going to look like this when I started pulling all of this data. Um, but that's, you know, the, the proportion of protected lands in, in Dutchess County that have been protected by the DLC is close to 60%. So, we're pretty proud of that, actually. It's, it's been a really rewarding journey. And, there's too many words on this slide for me to go through all of them, but I did, this is kind of what we talked about initially with the history of the land. Why is land conservation important to you? Because the land has that story to tell. And it, you know, we always think of land in terms of its scenic value. And I understand that. I like a pretty landscape as much as anybody. But as an ecologist, I think of it as, um, you know, the land isn't just sitting there being pretty. It's doing a lot of work. So it's growing our food, of course. We've got all of these farms and all these you know, wonderfully diverse agriculture in the area. And in addition to that, we've got intact forests. And an intact forest is doing a huge amount of work in terms of scrubbing the air of toxins, um, pulling contaminants out of groundwater, reducing erosion during storm events, because when a forest Inter when the canopy of the forest intercepts rain as it's falling during a heavy rainstorm, it hits the ground more gradually, which means you don't get as much erosion, you don't get as many washouts when you have a nice intact forest to soak up the rainfall. Same thing with wetlands, they can soak up a lot of rain. So maintaining those intact ecosystems allows the land to function in a way that supports not just us, but all life from, you know, the you know, the big things we all know about, you know, the deer and the bear and, and all that fun stuff, to the microbes in the soil. There's so much going on that's at the microscopic level, but is allowing that landscape to function in a way that's supporting all of this life. And so I want to wrap up with one of the best photos ever taken. So you probably recognize this from the Apollo 8 mission. That was the very first space flight that took humans outside of Earth orbit. It was a huge gamble, and they weren't really sure those people were coming back. Um, but it was a huge success. And when that capsule came around the dark side of the moon, what they saw was this Earth rise. It's one of the most famous photos ever taken. And you know, this was in 1968. It was a very difficult year. And this happened in, in late December. They actually orbited the moon on Christmas Day. And putting it in perspective, 
also involves the Hudson Valley because this photo was one of the things that kickstarted the environmental movement. So, you know, the late 60s, the early 70s, things are really, really starting to happen. And if you think about what happened here, the Hudson Valley was really a crucible for a lot of progress that was made during those times. If you think about, um, you know, the power plant that was proposed on Storm King Mountain, and that really generated Scenic Hudson as an organization, and also the Clearwater, which, remember, Pete Seeger sailed the Clearwater to Washington, and because of those things, the Clean Water Act was passed, and the Clean Air Act was passed, and those things had a huge, huge impact on human health, the health of the landscape. You know, you probably know people who um, would never go near the Hudson River. I've talked to people who were on their crew team in high school in the 60s, and they had to get special immunizations to be on, on the crew team, because being in contact with that filthy Hudson River water was actually pretty dangerous. And so, you know, now you can swim in the Hudson. You can boat in the Hudson. It's so much cleaner than it used to be because of that, because of the Clean Water Act, because of Pete Seeger and the clear water. And so all of those things kind of came together at that time. And this photo was a big part of that. And I think one of my favorite comments ever from the space program is what um, Bill Anders said. He was the command module pilot on Apollo 8. He was the one who took this picture. And there was a lot of excitement about the mission, but the photo is what so many generations recognize and remember. And the way he looked back on it was to say, you know, we came all this way to explore the moon, and the most important thing is that we discovered the Earth. Because they took that moment to turn around and look and see the Earth as this fragile system in this inky black void. And I think that's one of the things that speaks very strongly to conservation in general, to that conservation ethic that we've developed to treat the land as a functioning system and to protect it so that it continues to function to support life. And it's a testament to the value of seeing what's in your own backyard. You know, these guys went all the way to the moon and turned around and saw the earth as a wonderful thing. But, you know, we all can do the same thing. <coughs> you know, the road that you drive down every day, your very own backyard, there's so much there to still discover. And so that, to me, is what conservation is really doing, is allowing us to, to kind of take that into the future. And so with that, I will thank you very much for having me, and I'll be glad to take a Someone comes to you, DLC, and says, I want to put my farm under easement. And maybe 10 years later they die and the farm is sold. But it continues to be under? Mm -hmm. Yes, the easement runs with the land. It's a perpetual document, so it does not expire. So when the new landowner buys it, the easement comes up in their title search so that they should, they'll be aware that they have it. And then we'll meet with them to go over the easement so that they understand it. And that's a really, really important part of what we do. You know, the original landowner who granted the easement in the first place, they know what it says because they negotiated the whole document with us. But that next generation of landowner that takes over also needs to be aware of what's in that document so that they can work within it. How do you use the word easement? Easement, oh my, you'd have to ask an actual lawyer, and I'm an ecologist, um, but there's a lot of different types of easements. Uh -huh. So, you know, utility easements that you might have if a power line goes across your property, for example. Those are entirely different, and I know zilch about them. Conservation easements I do know about, and it's basically um, a way that, you know, the landowner can acknowledge the presence of an, an outside interest, basically. So, like, a utility, interest, a utility easement is saying, yeah, there's a power line going across my land. And, and I'm going to pay with that. And a conservation easement is different in that it is perpetual. It's a perpetual document, and it's much more carefully negotiated. It's, it's a pretty long document, um, but it, they're all individually negotiated. So we sit down with the landowner and we say, what are your goals? What do you want this property to look like in decades or centuries from now? And how can we achieve that? And so 
will do that by, um, you know, restricting certain uses of the property. So saying that, you know, you can, you have the right to build, let's say, two houses, but they can only be in these building envelopes, which we situate in ways that have the least amount of impact on the natural resources. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there's a field full of prime farmland soils, we try to not have a building envelope there because soils take a really long time to, to generate. Um, it's on the order of centuries in many cases. So we want to protect the soils that we have. It takes a really long time to generate more, and when you build something on them, they're not farmland soils anymore. You've probably seen the bumper stickers that say, no farms, no food. That's kind of what we're saying. You have to protect the soils so we can continue to grow food in the soils. And um, a part of what we do in our education component is to remind people that food comes from the ground, which not everybody knows. You know, not everybody knows that that potato came out of the dirt. Not everybody knows that that egg came out of that chicken's butt. And so that's the kind of education we also try to do, is to connect people with the land in a lot of different ways, whether it's going for a hike or visiting a farm, and, you know, making those connections more real for people. This is a slightly different type of question, but the building where you're at um, on, on 44 there, um, what do you know about the history of that building? Or how did you acquire that building? Or how did well, we don't own it, actually. It's part of the Thorne Estate, so we lease it from the Thorns. And um, we've been there since the early 2000s. Um, it's a gatehouse, actually. And there's an identical one on South Road. So that whole section of land from our office all the way up over the hill onto South Road, all part of the Thorn Estate, there was a mansion up in the woods back there that was um, torn down years and years ago. But our office is in a gatehouse, and then there's an identical building on South Road that was also for that same part of the land. Yeah. Yes, um, glaciers. Uh, did glaciers only came to the eastern part of the United States, or no, no glaciers that carved out anything on the, on the western part? The, yeah, the western part was more intact. The glacier did come south of the, what is it, the 42nd parallel, or 43rd parallel? Whatever the boundary is with Canada. Um, so there was definitely um, a glacier in the northern part of the Midwest, but most of the Midwest was not glaciated. With the most recent glaciation, which is the only one we can know about, because each glaciation wipes out all traces of all previous glaciations. <laughs> Um, almost all traces. They just bulldoze right across the land. And so, you know, ice ages have been coming and going for a long time and always will, but on a very, very long time scale. So the most recent, recent glaciation, um, I can actually... So this is the most recent glaciation. So there are two main ice sheets. The Laurentide was the big one. And so you can see, you know, it's completely covering the Great Lakes and coming down a little bit into the Mississippi Valley and a little bit into the upper Midwest. Uh, but the boundary with Canada is probably like about here. And the Cordilleran ice sheet was a separate one that was on the West Coast. Yeah. So the middle part of the United States was in, in it was on the ocean. It was a sea for a long time, and so a lot of the soils there have, and the rocks have developed um, from that. So you need a geologist to explain all of that to you, but I can tell you that much, that that was um, an ancient sea. Wasn't the Millbrook Hunt instrumental in saving some of the, in, in preserving some of the land around Van Van Scoten property and some of that area? I don't know the particulars of that. Um, I don't know if, if of the hunt as the organization was part of that. Certainly many members of the hunt uh, were part of all of this initial stages of the DLC and that protecting, um, galvanizing and protecting those lands on Bangalore Road. I just sort of have a comment, I guess, and it's something that I think about, <laughs> so I'll share it. Um, but historically, looking at the landscape we drive through the countryside of Millbrook and it's gorgeous and it has fields and hedgerows and stone walls and all. Um, 
But what I always like to think about is that those fields were not here when the first European settlers arrived, really, or started cutting down the trees, just as you showed, the whole diorama of, of the change. But it, it's just sort of an interesting thing, because our whole concept of open space and rural farmland and dairy farms is all based on a more present time view of the dairy farm and the fields. But that wasn't here, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I do the same thing yeah. when I'm out walking in the woods or driving around the yeah. landscape and try to imagine what it was like at that time. Yeah. And, you know, thinking about the forest being cut down, but also soils eroding, because once the forests were cut down, a lot of hooved livestock was introduced into the area, which churns up the soil and allows it to erode much more easily. Mm -hmm. So there would have been probably quite thick layers of really rich topsoil that would have washed away in the first couple generations of farming on these lands because the tree roots weren't there to hold it in place anymore. Right. And so that also changed the land, allowed a lot more rocks to come to the surface. It changed the very contours of the land, which we think of as so permanent, you know, this, this topographic landscape that we're used to looking at. Um, but it would have been a lot different, and the beaver dams would have been a huge presence. There would have been a lot more water in the landscape. Yeah. yeah, it's really, really interesting to think about all those changes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your lecture was excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's a great segue. Yeah. Julie, thank you very much. That was terrific. <laughs> and um, there are cookies. If people want cookies before they leave, I'll uncover them over there. Thanks. But let's give Bye, you another Robert. round of applause. <laughs>